Um, I'm going to sit down, if you don't mind, because I've got to see my screen here. Um, so um, let me give some context. It was actually Justin who was asking loads of questions earlier. And uh, I said, well, how about if I do a demo? And he was interested uh, as to how I came about getting the site that I'm using. Well, just to give you some history here, um, we lived in southwest London until about 18 months ago. And um, as you all know, I was well into DXing, but I had quite a, a restricted uh, setup. It was just verticals in a small garden. And um, we'd been thinking for a long time of moving out to the countryside. And um, my wife's brother was living in Shrewsbury, and we, we liked that area. So we started house hunting around there. And of course, I viewed this as an opportunity to get some land and put towers up and all that kind of thing. Um, in reality, finding houses with land is very difficult. And um, those that are available are snapped up by the equestrian community. And um, we rented a, a house for, well, we, we had a 12 month rental and we were in there for six or seven months looking around. And um, we'd seen quite a lot of places, but they didn't tick the boxes for, for both of us in terms of radio and, you know, nice place to live and so on. Um, and the house that we were renting, which we really liked, the landlord said to us that he was going to put it on the market. Uh, and we said, after some thinking, that we'd like to buy it. Now, it's not got a great big garden, um, but I'd kind of conceded at this stage that actually what I'd have to do is rent some land or buy some land and set up the station separately. So we love the house that we've, we've, we've bought and we love Shrewsbury. Um, and I set about trying to find some land that I could uh, establish a station. Now, I, I was open-minded. I thought, you know, I don't mind buying some land or renting some land, whatever would work. Um, and I asked around locally and nothing was really going. So I started ringing some estate agents and there's several um, sort of agricultural estate agents around there. Um, a couple of, couple of them I rang and I was explaining what I wanted the land for. Um, a couple of them said, well, come to our auctions. You know, there's land for sale there. There, there was in fact some land for sale down the road a um, couple of acres, but there was um, py a pylon and electrical cables through the land. Um, and then there was one estate agent I rang, uh, a guy called Roger Parry, and um, he listened to what I said, and he said, he said, you know what, you'd be better off renting, to be honest, because um, you need shelter for what you're doing, you need electricity, um, and I had previously, incidentally, talked to Bob GU for YOX about getting electricity into a, a new piece of land. And you can commission the uh, local power authority to um, bring power into your land, provided you have a suitably secure um, terminal box for it. But even that is, if, you, if you're fairly close to the 11 kV lines, is about it would set you back about 20, 25 k to get the power in. And if you're paying, you know, 40, 50 k for the land as well, it's starting to, to ramp up. Um, this one estate agent said to me, he said you'd be far better off renting the land. And I said, okay, well, if you know, if you know of some land that's going, then um, please let me know. And then he rang me back 20 minutes later and said, I've got, I've got what you're looking for. <laughs> so, I, so I said, okay. Um, and uh, he, said, he said, yes, it's my sister. <laughs> his, his sister. His sister. So Roger, Roger Perry, the estate agent, it, I mean, he's a big landowner in, in Shropshire. And um, I mean, I've been up to his, his house since. He's got this huge mansion in a load of land. A lot of it is rented out. And his sister, his two sisters share a house about um, a mile and a half up, up the road from where he is. So, you know, the whole family, the family must own a lot of that part of Shropshire, I think. But um, basically, I, I went over to see Tracy, the lady, and um, she, th there's about an acre and a little bit of, of land. And I've got some pictures here, actually, of um, what it was I went to see. So bas basically, you, you drive in. Um, it's about five miles, five miles south of Shrewsbury. And um, you, I mean, you need a four-wheel 
drive vehicle to get in um, and you cross some fields and basically the land is this parcel of land sort of here and it's just over an acre but these are old um, agricultural buildings they they had pigs in them there's loads of asbestos there i don't think they've been used for probably 30 maybe 40 years but one of the sheds the one in this far corner has a, um, an electricity supply into it and also within um, you can see um, from the field there's two mobile phone masts one is Vodafone and the other is EE so potentially it had everything that I needed it had power space um, and internet connectivity you can see here that um, it's it's fairly in the middle of nowhere as well there is a farm building here um, sort of behind the trees um, which is owned but it's not owned by the same owner of of, of this land um, but that's that's the nearest building and then the next nearest house is about half a mile away I suppose um, so I went in and had a look at um, this land and basically this is this is the pig shed um, with the power coming in and you can see on the right hand side there this is where the electricity meter is this is the meter box um, so I thought well if I'm going to put a remote station in here it needs to be um, a bit more secure and um, it's very leaky as well it, it you know it needs to needed to be um, secured from the weather as well um, there's another shot of the inside you can see there's holes in the side the walls and the roof and so on but um, and, and that's a view down the other sheds it's very very derelict and quite dangerous actually if you're climbing around there but um, that's what I did to it I got a builder in uh, once it signed the lease agreement and so on I took a, a month um, lease out on the land got a builder in guy who lives around the corner from me he did all this breeze block work put the door on it and um, made it secure from um, you know a burglary perspective um, first thing I did was put this um, sort of table in with a you can see a PC and um, this is a, f a 4G router here um, and it's a dual sim one so I put a dual I put two sims in one for Vodafone and one for EE one of on each of the networks that were available um, PC and this is an, an SDR IQ receiver here uh, you know a little um, uh, SD receiver and I actually put a 20 meter dipole in the shed um, the site is about 750 feet um, above sea level with a great uh, takeoff to the to the north sort of um, from the US through north across to, J to Japan it's a clear takeoff um, so it's it's pretty good radio wise and just that dipole in the shed I, bef actually before I was paying any rent he let me try it for a couple of months just to make sure it was okay although I'd had the outlay on the um, the building works but you can see here I'd, I'd left these in here and I came up one day and the whole lot was soaked um, so I realized that I needed to put some weather prote protection in there as well so what I did over time I, d I don't anyone at GMDX the other week would have seen Paul present about his remote station MM0 BZH, BZH. and um, these boxes were, were his idea basically these um, Solent plastics they're from and um, I've actually got two of those now um, I started off using the K3 and the Expert Amp. Uh, the K3 is with the remote rig units, and I was using the win for k 3 software. A Canadian bloke does it. Um, and I did CQ Worldwide 160 CW um, with, with that. And it, it, it worked, but it was, um, and I'd put up a 160 meter vertical in the field, obviously. Um, but it was just very clunky. Um, you know if you wanted to turn the volume up and use the RIT and tune the VFO all at the same time it's just like all over the place um, but then um, I forget the order of, of, of things but um, a little later uh, I put an advert out um, is David you and you and David here no um, the, the one who I bought the K30 front panel from <laughs> I was gonna say you and a but that's you it's um, G3U UEG, thank you. 
Yeah, yeah, I thought I'd seen him. Yeah. So he, um, I put an advert out um, somewhere, maybe on the CDSC, um, looking for a K3. I know we'd been talking about it on another reflector, and um, I managed to get this K30 front panel, um, which is the, obviously the remote end through the remote rig units for the K3, and it abs absolutely transformed the um, the operation and made makes everything much slicker. Um, one of the challenges of um, Oh, and I found some hardline on eBay, 350 meters for th for 300 quid, bargain. Um, so um, yeah, I went to collect that, and and what I've got now, well, that's when I bought the second box as well because I realised that I needed to kind of separate the gear out. It's not very clear on where well, you can just see on here. I've got um, I built fans into. Um, the um, the boxes to keep it all cool. Um, there was one of the posts I put on the CDSC reflector about the remote station. I forget the detail, but following that, I had a had an offer to borrow a Flex 6500 um, to try out the station. Now, one of the challenges of using 4G is that um, it doesn't provide you with a public IP address. So. Um, and in fact, the, the way I'd got around that initially was the same approach that Paul from GMDX used. Um, and it was on his advice that I bought the, the Draytech routers because the way they work, this Draytech router at this end with the SIM cards dials out over VPN to my fixed IP address at home. So um, it, it calls me. The restriction on that is that I can only ever operate this remote station with the K3 from home because that's where my static IP address is. Um, and I wanted to explore other options whereby I could use um, the radio station from anywhere else, from hotel rooms or, or wherever. And um, anyway, there was something I put on the CDSC reflector and um, someone um, who's not here this weekend, but they got in contact with me and said, would you like to borrow a Flex 6500? Um, because potentially it will give you the ability to operate um, from other places. But it's not that straightforward. Uh, because there's no um, public IP address here, um, he put me on to using a, a product called Zero Tier, which is a kind of cloud-based cloud um, VPN. Um, and it, it's it's brilliant. It's really really good. And uh, what that has allowed me to do is um, use the f the flex. However, it's not without its challenges. So um, this was the 160 meter vertical that I put up for CQ Worldwide 160. Um, just last week, um, I put a hex beam up. So the this that's the view to the north actually. So the the hex beams at about 35 feet. It's actually a P80 heavy duty Versa tower on a, a on a trailer, um, but it's just it's tucked right down at the moment, and I just want to see, um, yeah, how it goes down with the the locals, basically. But that is the view to the north, so you can see it's absolutely clear um, in in the distance, uh, and it's it's like that for you know sort of US all the way through to to to, to Japan. Um, Oh, just some. T what 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 I did realise was fairly quickly that I just need to document everything that I do because it's very easily to, easy to get mixed up and forget what you've put where. So you can see here I've got the two boxes, the two plastic boxes in one of, um, in the other I've got the amplifier. Um, this is the sort of radio control side wiring. What I realised was also that. Um, in terms of the configuration management, if you like, to put it in professional terms, um, it, I've, it's best if I document everything separately. Um, so I've got focused uh, kind of architecture diagrams. So this is the um, the VPN, LAN to LAN VPN. Um, that's the LAN at the remote site. So um, everything is IP addressable from home, so I can control it, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, I've got a, an environment monitor in there that tells me um, if, if any light um, appears in the boxes. I know they've been opened. I get an alarm at home. Um, I did try a Raspberry Pi on digital modes, but um, didn't have much success with that. Um, I've got a relay board which um, on a Raspberry Pi, which I 
can show you in a minute, that switches the flex on and off. So I bought my own flex since um, I borrowed that um, other one. That should say flex 6500 actually. Um, I didn't want to initially, but I've put a, a PC in there now as well. Um, the, f the flex didn't work out very well, unfortunately. What I found was using it for the internet, um, there was just too much latency in there, um, like a, s a second, which of course is no good for CW. Um, what I've been using the on-site PC for is um, for data modes with, with the flex. So it's controlling locally and I just remote desktop um, in, into this. Um, Zero tier is the uh, networking solution um, that allows me access from remote. And um, this is a, a serial port to Ethernet server. So um, the expert amplifier, which isn't in this diagram, has a serial port. And I plug that into the serial server. And that um, gives me access to the expert amplifier um, with an IP address over, over the internet. Um, What's not on here also is the rotator that I use for the hex beam. Um, I've, so the, the Yesu controller, I've got one of those um, ER, ERC, ERM, German, ERC, I think, um, boards. Um, and that's got a serial port on it. And so I plugged that into this as well. It's dual serial port. And that provides um, IP access to the rotor. So... Um, what I've got in there now is a, um, a flex. Uh, that's the power layout. So that's another view. That's how the power is distributed. Um, so I've, I've got an IP controlled mains switch, which allows me to kill um, the radios if I need to. Um, I've got um, I've got uh, on the same mains controller. Uh, there's a switch on there which will uh, reboot, recycle if um, it fails to ping, uh, a, I think the BBC website I've put in there. So if it loses internet connection, the router will reboot. Yeah. Um, the NUC PC is set for wake on LAN and also for power on, on power up. Um, early on, when I first put this in. Um, I kept losing connectivity and I had to go over to the site, which is about five miles away, about three times to just try and work out why it wasn't connecting. So what I can do now is connect um, through to one of the Raspberry Pis um, and issue a wake on LAN magic packet from there and it will wake up the, the NUC. Um, the other thing uh, I've done with the NUC PC, actually, I'd, I've got AnyDesk uh, as a remote access um, solution on there. But I've also put another uh, remote access um, product on there called, um, oh, what's it called? Um, something VNC. I want to say thick VNC, but it's not that. It begins with T anyway. Tight. Tight VNC, someone said. I think that's it. Um, so anyway, there's two, there's two remote access solutions on there. And between them, usually one of them works. Um, so that's the setup. Um, so let's access it. Right. I'm not proud of this, but what I'm going to do, because it's more visual than um, demonstrating SSB or CW, is do FT8 through WSGT. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so what I've what I've got here, I just started these earlier to make sure oops, to make sure they work. But um, I use this. Um, so the the serial to Ethernet um, adapter or server. With that on the client here, I run some cross software called USRVCom. And basically, that creates two, two serial ports on here. Uh, one's used for the rotor. The, the other is the expert amp. And you can see here, I've got the expert amp 
uh, control program. Uh, I can switch the input between the flex or uh, the other one is the Elecraft. So I've got that there. Uh, and all the control I can need, I need, I can put it in operate mode. Um, the rotor, I use um, PST rotator. Um, you can see that's actually that's connected through the IP address. And I can turn the rotor from here. And um, so there's two ways of accessing the, the flex. Either I can access the um, flex from here with Smart SDR. Now, you'll see if I bring this up on here, so it is tuned to 15 meters. You see um, down here, it tells you the, the latency. That's the sort of ping time, I, I believe. You can see it. You could see it. I think I can, uh, if I do this. So it tells you the, um, the real-time latency, which isn't actually too bad uh, in terms of the, 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 the ping time. But um, I did a test whereby I had my laptop here listening to a station round at a friend's house with a real radio, and there was about a one-second delay. So this, this kind of ping time here is a little bit misleading. So for CW, or um, well, particularly for CW, and even for SSB, it's pushing it a little bit, that, that kind of delay. So really, the flex has been relegated to data modes. Um, the K3 at home, which I can only use from home with the remote rig unit because of the public IP address issue, um, the delay is about 165 milliseconds. If I compare that to a, a real radio next to it, listening at the same time to the same signal, which is much more sort of uh, usable. So I use the K3 for SSB and CW, and um, the Flex, I can access it from anywhere, like a hotel, um, and I've been using it for, let's say, data modes. Um, now, the, the example I have today happens to be FT8, which is, um, as you know, uh, a popular data mode. So, what I'm going to do, uh, actually, is rather than run uh, Smart SDR locally, I'm going to remote in uh, using AnyDesk to the NUC PC that's in the remote station. And I'm going to smart start Smart SDR on here. Oh, it's opened. There we go. Some interesting interference there, isn't there? And let me just check the DAX and the CAT is open. It looks like it. What's the wrong one? Yeah, okay. So I should be able to start um, WSJT. And what I've done, actually, the, the, the NUC PC is um, connected on the Ethernet in, in the, on the LAN in the remote shack to the um, Flex, but also has a input from the K3 through a, a USB sound card. So I have two profiles on WSJT. I have um, on the configurations, I've got the, the, you see here where we've got the uh, configurations. I've got one for the Allocraft K3 and one for the Flex radio. So I can, I can use either radio um, for my uh, WSJT. What I have found, you'll notice that I've got a really slow refresh rate on the screen here. Um, and that's because as you crank up the refresh rate, um, so increases the data consumption on my 4G SIM. Yeah, and if I crank it up to the maximum, it's about 10, 10 um, megs per second, I think, um, which is quite a lot when it adds up over, say, 24 hours. Kerry? How much bandwidth have you got at the moment? Bandwidth doesn't translate that to you. Can we get an idea of the connectivity at all? So, um, how much display have I got here? Yeah, apologies. Uh, how much 
<laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> yes. How, how much spectrum is displayed at the moment in the, in the band scope there that you've got on the screen? Well, I've just maximised that, obviously, but it's going from about um, 21.06.3, maybe, to 21.08.4. I've, I mean, I've zoomed in on that, 21.07. Yeah, that's not big. I, I couldn't see how big it was, because obviously the more, that you, the wider you have it open, the more data's going through. Yeah, so, yeah, well, I thought that might be the case, but it doesn't, it's not the case. Yeah, there you go, it's not the case. It, it, it really is determined by, um, in the display here, the the rate, which I've got down at one, and the frames per second, which I've got down at, at one. And I found that actually the visible um, bandwidth doesn't make much difference. Okay, thank you. Is that the one I want? Yes, it is. So, um, let's, um, so, that, <laughs> so I've got, I've got the, what I tend to do actually is just minimize that because ev even the, um, smart SDR window in the um, remote desktop uses extra data as well. So what it, w once I know that smart SDR is sort of up and running and the mode and bandwidth are uh, correct and everything, I tend to minimize that. And what you're seeing here, the average um, data rate is about 300K per second um, on average. And obviously the only real updates are every 15 seconds when everything splurges through the screen. So um, what, what I perhaps should have done if I knew I was going to do this was put the rotor control onto the NUC PC so that we could see it all on the same screen. But if I, um, I don't know where the band's open to at the moment, probably the US at this time of day. So if I um, turn the rotor over towards the US, then go back into uh, any desk, you can see here the, um, the, st the stuff coming through. Um, so, I mean, that's it really. I mean, <laughs> obviously this is more visual but, um, than using SSB or CW, but what I've got here is um, a solution that can get me on the air from a hotel room. Better with two screens, really, because normally I'd have, I mean, at home, um, I have on one screen the roads control, the expert amp control, um, what I was going to show you actually was um, I use, this is a very simple impl implementation of something that's called Node Red, which is a sort of um, a, a workflow control or um, I don't know what you'd call it really, it allows you to um, program workflows to control internet uh, IoT and internet of thing, things devices. Um, and what I've got here is just a very simple imp implementation that controls the Raspberry Pi, uh, one of the Raspberry Pis that's up at the station. So I can switch the cooling fans on and off, just it's a 12 volt supply to the fans, and it's the remote. Um, um, I can switch the flex on and off from that. The, um, the other things that I access from um, here are, so, the remote mains switch, um, I can, that's the kill switch on the 12 volt 13.8 supply that, kill, uh, that feeds the flex and the K3. Um, the other output on this uh, output two feeds the, um, I, I don't switch that one off, <laughs> but um, it will recycle if, um, it fails to ping a particular website. So, you know, if it gets, you know what it's like, you have to reboot your, your, your router at home from time to time. Um, what else have I got on here? Um, so I can access the yeah, home and remote routers as well. And um, there's the RRC units that um, provide the connectivity for the K3 as well. So everything's accessible um, through the web. Um, I've overcome the lack of public IP address um, constraint that you have with 4G at the remote station using zero tier. Um, the is, is not good remote for me because of the latency, but it's okay for data modes. 
and um, certainly the K3 plus the K30 head unit are abso absolutely superb. Um, the main sort of bottleneck on everything that I'm doing at the moment is my broadband at home, um, which is um, an old, old you know, copper wire setup, and we're getting fibre to the premises later this year, so I'm hoping that that will open up more possibility in terms of what I'm doing. There you go. Have, uh, Chris, G4 FCN, have you thought of the possibility of, because it's only five miles away from home, have you thought about running a microwave link oh, yes. between there and home? Yeah, there's a hill between me and there. Unfor unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it is, um, it, you know, um, I'm glad it is only five miles away, actually, because, um, I mean, I, I got the place in sort of September last year, and I've, I've I mean, Don and Hillary came up a few weeks ago, and um, Don, what I've done since you were there is I've got the hex beam up now, the towers um, in the air. Um, what I've got there now is um, a single 40 meter vertical, which I'm hoping to have a four square on 40 um, for next winter anyway. Um, I've got a, an 80 meter vertical, which is uh, based on a 12 meter spider pole with a capacity hat. Um, I've got a 160 meter vertical based on a 20 meter spider pole with a capacity hat. I've modified an old butternut HF2V to work on um, 30 and 60. So I've got all bands now from 160 through through 10, but it's been a hell of a lot of work. Um, and it's actually been quite knackering, <laughs> just going up there and doing all that. Um, you know, and every time you, because it's in the hills, you've got to prepare for the, um, the worst of the, the weather as well. Um, at, actually, a, um, a pal of mine helped me out a couple of weeks ago um, to bring some of the big, thick um, hardline coax up. He's got a, um, a bigger car than me. Uh, his is two-wheel drive, and we took it over to the field, um, not even as far as the shed and the shack, but um, just through the first gate, and his car got stuck. You know, so um, I've got a four-wheel drive car, which I bought after I took, after I got the field, because otherwise I'd get stuck. But um, hard work, but I've just got to a stage now. I mean, I did the UK and EI contest last weekend, and um, I think 630 QSOs, and out of the 12-hour section, I came third. Um, and thankfully, uh, Ron and Don were both away. Um, <laughs> You can, but the two guys ahead of me both had two. They were using SO2R. You know, they had two radios. So for a single radio setup, I'm really, really pleased with what it's doing. And I'm, you know, having come from a suburban environment, sorry as well. I am. I'm now working stuff that I never ever heard um, when I was in Surrey. I, in fact, just this morning, by way of an example, I. Um, went on 15 meters CW um, and worked a, a JA who was running 10 watts, followed by a JA mobile running 50 watts with a three three foot whip. He said, on on the car, and I would never have dreamed of that living in the old QTH. So it's just opened up a whole new world. Well, thanks, John. I um, I think it was a very nice round off to the day, wasn't it? And tremendous stuff in the time you've done it as well. That's what amazes me. So, a round of applause for John. Thanks.